Hi, and uh, welcome back. This uh, camshaft crisis saga has been sort of tying everything up, and uh, I want to uh, start expanding and elaborating on some of these YouTube videos. I'm not sure what some of you folks would be interested in watching, as there's a lot of uh, a lot of guys out there just building engines, all sorts of them. I mean, most of them are Chevrolet or uh, Ford-oriented compared to the Chryslers, but uh, I've got a number of different projects on here, and, you know, <clears throat> some are small blocks, some are big block Chryslers. Uh, I got a stroker going, and I'm not sure if you're interested in seeing one or the other as a as a complete engine build. Um, email me, let me know at uh, metalmaxmopar at gmail, or just email or just comment on this uh, video. One thing I want to discuss today, though, about engine building, is uh, precision measuring tools. Uh, the days when we were just using, you know, things like uh, plastic gauge are almost over, unfortunately. And uh, the, the reason for that is the, uh, the machining on the components is becoming so poor. And I'm going to address some of that here. Uh, without precision, precision measuring equipment, uh, plastic gauge is just not going to cut it. And uh, especially with things like... Um, taper on the rods. Now this is a brand new rod. It's for a big block Chrysler. It's an H-beam. Um, and it doesn't matter who's manufacturing these right now. If it's Eagle, if it's SCAD, if it's PCE, um, you're going to have to check it. Uh, they're, they, <coughs> they're not round. And <laughs> there's a taper. And these rods here, I just had a set for a big block Chrysler. They've all, all eight of them had to be, uh, the big end needed machining, remachining to get them round and to take the taper out. And the taper on a, on a number of them, I think on three of them, was over a thou. And I'm talking, when I'm talking taper, I'm talking about the inside edge to the outside edge on this rod. So just this distance here, a thou. Now, you'll find that out with plastic gauge when you go to assemble the engine, but you've already assembled the engine. So you're going to end up with a plastic gauge smear that's going to be much wider on one end on the bearing clearance and narrow on the other end. You're going to be scratching your head as to why. And you'll be saying, gee, is it the crankshaft journal or is it the rod? Well, unfortunately, uh, with my experience right now, I've got good crank grinders and most of the cranks I've measured up the, out of the box, whether they be from SCAT or from Eagle, or some of the better grind, or some of the better manufacturers out there, um, the tolerances are pretty tight on the crank. We'll get into a problem with the cranks, especially with the Eagles, in a little bit here. But anyways, this is what I want to discuss today. In this particular rod here, this is another set of big block Chryslers, and they are out also. I've got uh, three of these rods here that are measuring anywhere from eight ten thou to 1.1 thou taper across it, and they're not round. So without measuring it, you're just going to guess when you go to assemble it, and you're going to say, hey, you know, like something's funky, something's wrong. And uh, you say, that's why I'm saying the days of plastic gauge with the way quality control is right now, it's just, it's terrible. And, you know, I mean, it's the reality of it. I mean, I don't want to be, you know, seem like a guy that just pisses and moans in his videos all the time, but this is just the stark reality of it all. You're going to have to check everything. And, you know, when we talked about marketing last time when it came to motor oils, uh, here's another classic marketing, you know, scam in a way. If I, I consider it, you know, a marketing scam. Is this H-beam versus I-beam? Um, this is Engineering 101. Or it's actually remedial, remedial mechanical engineering. I-beams are superior in strength to H-beams. Period. I mean, just look at any construction. Look at aircraft construction. Look at bridge construction. Look at building construction. They all use an I-beam design. Not H-beams. So to have the same strength for the same material. Say we're talking 4340 with these particular, the Manleys. And these guys here, the Eagles, they're 4340 material. Same length, right? Bushed. <laughs> the strength between these two in, in tensile and in compression would be different. And the I-beams would be superior, far superior to the H-beams. 
But, you know, the marketing groups out there, again, you know, they, they considered, well, this, you know, the H-beams are new, you know, the, the new and the best thing out there. Well, the H-beams have to be heavier to meet the same strength of the I-beams. That's just, that's just an engineering fact. Now, this is not, you know, this is not politics or this is not, you know, religion or something. This is just, this is just a fact. And yet, but look at the number of companies out there that are making H-beam rods versus I-beams. And you have to scratch your head. You know, up is down, black is now white, and, and it's all become marketing. There's no reason to be running H-beams over I-beams. There's no, there's no advantage at all. No advantage anywhere. Now, it's, it's ignorance. And this is one of, I say, one of the things I want to just discuss, right? And the difference, say, between these two, just look at the bushings. These are, these manlies, these are uh, the old sportsmen. They're not even available anymore. Again, it's things that I've bought in the past that I've stocked up on because I just knew, right? But when you look at the difference and just in the, in the, in the, bronze bushing area on I think these guys here are sprayed on and then machined as these these are press fit the other thing I wanted to point out with crankshafts I've run into this problem and this was pointed out to me um, from a, a, another uh, engine builder here in southern Ontario and that's a thank you to Randy Hodges uh, he builds big block risers mostly for drag racing, but he pointed this out to me because he has a thorough machine shop uh, and he did a, lot, a number of checking. And the snout on a number of the eagles are machined improperly. Uh, I haven't found it on the, on, the, on the scats and I haven't found it on any of the other ones uh, aftermarket, but the eagles, uh, they've been coming up um, three to four thou out. So when you rotate the crankshaft, you're expecting to see zero on the gauge for a run out. And this is just a stock crank. And I'm getting you know, bugger all, not even half a thou run out as I rotate this crank around. On the eagles, the snouts are bent up, sometimes four thou. So it would be a total of eight thou run out. As, it, as this crankshaft rotates. And that balancer will be doing, it'll be doing the walk of death. And uh, when, the, when the snout snaps off, that's why. Because the crankshaft's machined improperly. And this is, again, this is, this is all the stuff you're going to have to check. Without checking, you don't know. And when you have a catastrophic failure... Right, like, and I've seen a number of the YouTube videos out there with catastrophic failures on the bottom end, and they're scratching their head as to why. That's why. That's part of the reason why. So, anyways, it's something. It's something to really consider if you want to do some serious engine building. Is precision instruments because plastic gauge and just some of the handheld tools, uh, they're not going to cut it anymore. This is the original uh, 440 block from my uh, 446 Pat Cuda, 1970 Cuda. And uh, I guess I'm f fortunate to still have it because uh, this was campaigned in super stock competition for a lot of years. And for those that uh, know something about the 440 Chryslers and the big block bottom ends, if you kind of take a look at it, you'll notice a few things that are a little different on it. And back in the day, in the 70s and the early 80s, uh, ARP didn't exist, so there was some modifications done to the uh, to the 440s and the 383s when they were raced in competition by guys to try to beef up the bottom ends. Uh, you wouldn't do it today because of the fact that you can get a ARP components and uh, a bottom end plate to stiffen the you know to stiffen the whole bottom end and the main caps. Uh, you wouldn't do any of this. But back in the days, these are 916 bolts. Instead of the half inch, and this was this was something that was done. It was, I'm not going to say fairly common, but for the guys that really went you know whole hog into super stock racing, they tried everything to uh, reinforce the bottom end. So they were drill and re-tap to a 916 bolt, 
And back in the day, like I say, they didn't use studs because the studs just weren't available. So they used aerospace fasteners. And that's what we used in this engine here. And if you look, uh, you also notice that the uh, oil pickup tube has been drilled and tapped for the Hemi half-inch pickup. And there's been all sorts of block modifications to this engine, right, for uh, super stock racing. Because uh, this thing used to go through the traps. Uh, there was a 513 gear in the car, a Dana 60. It had a 32-inch tall tire, and it'd go through the traps, you know, well over seven grand. You know, 7100 or so, and that's with factory, the factory 446 pack rods and the factory crank. So it's amazing it held together, right? Uh, this thing really has no business being around today. But I'm glad I took it out of service, you know, ages ago, and just kept it. And I wanted, to, I want to build the engine back up and just have it ready for the car at some point in the future. So what's in it right now, and why it's sort of mocked up this way? There's uh, the number one, number two, and the number seven, and number eight a rod and piston assembly in the engine. And I'm doing that so I can check the deck height on this engine. That's why it, there's no rings in it. That's why it turns so freely. And so I just flip it over, and I measure the uh, the top of the piston to the top of the deck because I want a zero deck on it, so I'm going to know, you know how much to skim off this. And I'm trying to remember, uh, if I remember correctly, the uh, crankshaft originally... I think it was uh, it was offset ground, and I think the rules allowed ten thou offset at that time, so that's why it's not a zero deck right now. Because the four forty six pack I think was a minus one thou uh, top dead center from from the top of the piston to the top of the deck, and that's what the rules allowed. So, anyways, but if you look at this crankshaft, it's out of a four thirteen. And this is just a 1050 crank, and there's a lot of weight removed from it. And if I was going to, have to race this thing in competition, I wouldn't have done what what I did here, because basically the 413 has a has a smaller counterbalance weight diameter than the 440s. And what you would want to do here, instead of removing weight this way just by drilling, Right, the whole idea would be to reduce the size of the counterweight. So you would take this material off, right, and make the whole counterweight smaller rather than drilling all this material out of it. So you'd get less windage. You'd still have the weight savings without the windage. But like I said, this this engine will never see competition again. So I'm not concerned about doing all that kind of extra work onto a stock crank. And I decided against going to a 4340 crank for this engine. Like I say, it's never going to see competition again. I mean, it's going to make some horsepower when I'm finished with it. But it's certainly not going to be flogged at you know 7,000 plus RPM. Anyways, this is the kind of things I uh, I don't know if people are interested in, in going through a build like this. And how, you know, from where we start and where we end up. But if you're interested, you know, give me some uh, feedback on it. And we can do a build up with this. And show you how it's all done. Anyways, thanks for watching. Bye-bye now.